Well, good morning and good day to each of you. It is a delight and it's also an honor to be here before you um, and to have the opportunity to share the history so that we can understand the steps that we have taken and look to the path that those steps have created for us together. I'd also like to say thank you at this moment to the other uh, companies in the industry who are represented here today. Make sure that um, I uh, don't exclude anyone, but uh, the Escalop team is here, and there's an important part of the Viscoliosi Brothers' history with Esculap. The Zimvi team is here, is that right? And there is also an important historical dynamic between Viscoliosi Brothers and the technology of Total Disc in Zimvi. The Orthofix team is here. And uh, is that right? Yep, there's the Orthofix team. Um, and uh, the Nuvasive and Globus team is here as well. Is that right? Yep. And uh, did I miss anyone from industry? So I'd like to begin by saying that it is a delight for the industry that is supporting motion preservation to be together with the physicians. It's essential that industry partner with the surgeon community to support the surgeon community to lead innovation in patient care. And in the early days of this industry, it was the Charité and the ProDisc. And uh, I was the CEO of Spine Solutions, which was a partnership, the joint venture between Esculap and Viscoliosi Brothers. And then there was Valdemar Link through Link Orthopedics that had uh, owned and developed the SB Charité. The, later became known as the Charité. Brian Cameron was the CEO before that. Andy Greenberg, these are some names that maybe some of you don't even know. Well, Brian and I got together at the first SAS, Spine Arthroplasty Society meeting. And I said, we should stop fighting about whose disc is better and think about changing the view of the industry and fight fusion rather than each other. Because if you put little ducks in a bathtub and add water, all the ducks rise, okay? So I wanna be part of everything rising, not just one. And that is a snippet of what we're gonna learn about today, which is how did it really happen. So let's go, and just like every other physician, I'm going to give you my disclosures. This first page says, whatever I say, one day will be held against me. <laughs> <laughs> this next page communicates the companies that my brothers and I uh, own today. We own 14 businesses in the neuromusculoskeletal space and 21 different investment funds that invest only in neuromusculoskeletal healthcare. We have sold to strategic buyers, only one company, an IPO. The rest, 18 of the 19 exits, have been sales to strategic buyers. Some to Stryker Corporation, for example, four different businesses over time. So the brothers have become known as um, a group that is solely dedicated to financing and developing innovation in your world. And <clears throat> we've exited or closed seven funds. In total, we've founded more than 61 different businesses, funds, and companies focused in this area. So that's the disclosures, the companies we own today, 
the companies we owned in the past. And you can see our footprint of what we owned in the past really uh, supported the direction of preserving motion and restoring form, function, and motion while alleviating pain in the spine industry. This has been our lives work. It's the legacy that we have built that is so important to change how people live their lives through your hands as physicians and through God's grace. Our identity is as a group to be a financier in the space. Well, people think we're investors. The bottom of this slide says we're not really investors. We're business builders. And this business building of discovering, creating, developing, financing, and operating businesses is the foundation of collaboration. No business that we have ever founded could have been done without the vision of a particular one or more surgeons behind the innovations that we chose to support the further evolution and development. Our careers began on Wall Street as investment research analysts. And this is part of the formation of the big picture that I'd like to tell you. So my, I've been doing this for 35, they're almost more than 35 years, investing and building. And together, my brothers and I worked on Wall Street. And you'll learn a little bit more about how and when we formed Viscoliosi Brothers, and why did we form it? And so this just talks about what we've done uh, and how we uh, invest in businesses all throughout what's called the capital structure, both equity and debt. We start them, invest in them along the way. Uh, by the way, those exits, we didn't make money on every one of them. We learned how to lose money. And every time <laughs> we lost, we learned more. So just like the healthcare is the practice of medicine, investing is the practice of business building. Um, and uh, what I would like to say here is um, that's my mug. This is the mug of my brother John and the mug of my brother Mark. I couldn't stand before you unless they stood behind me. So the three of us uh, have done this together. And although I'm here, I hope that you understand I speak for the three brothers in everything I say and do and share with you today. Being business builders is who we are. Now let's talk about what did we learn from the history of orthopedics? And what I'd like to say to you is that, <clears throat> go back in my career, because it's important to understand the big picture. So when I was a 14-year-old boy, I was nearly killed in an automobile bicycle accident, riding my bike to work as a caddy, and had grade three um, open uh, complex fractures of the tibia and fibula, fractures of the radius and ulna, face, head, neck um, injuries, and had a little bit of reconstruction work done. Well, I searched from that point forward about why did I live and what was I supposed to do with this new life that I got. And in 1988, I found the orthopedic industry in Kalamazoo and Warsaw, Indiana. And it was at that moment that I decided that orthopedics was going to be what the rest of my life was about. And importantly, that I wanted to sponsor innovation. So I had to learn how businesses were run so that I could help doctors take their ideas to help people lead a better quality life. <clears throat> In 1992, began with the focus only on the orthopedic industry. And between 88 and 99, 
together with my brother Mark, we published more than 7,000 pages of investment research, more than 1,000 investment uh, research reports, writing about the orthopedic industry and about the spine industry. And I was fortunate to be a young kid at the birth of the spine market. In 1988, there were only five publicly traded orthopedic businesses. There are hundreds today. And so, by the way, I decided if I'm going to do something, I'm going to be only number one or not do it. Well, it's pretty easy to be number one because there was no one else doing it. So I could say I was number one. That was easy. And now all of Wall Street, every major firm has an analyst team dedicated to the field of orthopedics and a banking team dedicated to medical technology to take your ideas forward. Well, while I was a research analyst in 1993, I discovered this thought process. What I call, and uh, there's a young intern that's here, uh, and I was talking with him earlier, and he said, where's the future going? And I said, think about the four R's. R, the letter R. Remove, repair, place, regenerate. <clears throat> The first solution in all of healthcare is to remove the problem. Remove the pain by removing the problem. Cut it out. Think about oncology. Think about early cardiac care. Think about early orthopedics. As physicians, surgeons, do what they do, do what you do, you create better ways to do something. And from removal became the second phase of evolution in technology innovation. Repair. Repair the problem um, by immobilizing it. So when you go to the doctor and, and you say, to the doctor, uh, when I move my elbow this way, it hurts. And the doctor says, well, stop moving your elbow that way. Pain will stop. Think fusion. Then technology evolves from remove, repair, to regenerate, excuse me, to repair uh, and replace. So if you look at the history of any anatomical field, we all move to the area of replacing the function of the body, whether that is, and think about stenting, as a replacement. Think about um, in urology a um, prosthetic sphincter as a replacement. And the fourth evolution and generation of technology is regenerate. Remove, repair, replace, regenerate. Regenerate is to help the body heal itself. Now each time you see this curve going up from the bottom, the population that is the group underneath the curve, the volume of patients able to be treated increases significantly every time we move from one phase to the other. More patients can be treated. Here in the regeneration phase, <clears throat> this is where the future of innovation is going to bring us. And this is what you are doing today. And replacing, which we're talking about today, replacing form, function, and motion while uh, alleviating pain is an, a key step in the direction. We cannot go to the direction of regeneration without first fully being deep in replacing the body's tissues and the function of those tissues. So what I'll also say um, is that we are already beginning in the phase of tissue regeneration in spine care. In fact, that began in 2002. I'll talk about that in a few more slides. 
And here we are. This is the slide. As technology evolves through the four R's, the time shortens from one R to the next, and the volume of patients increases between each technology generation. Frederick Albee first described fusion in a publication in 1911. It took 91 years from that description of a fusion for fusion to reach its ascendance to the pinnacle with the approval by the US FDA of Infuse in July 2002. 91 years. It took 61 years moving from repair to replace, and the time period decreased 30 years. So when one technology generation peaks, the next generation is already beginning in earnest. This is what happens in all of medical technology, okay? And so the Fernstrom ball was first implanted in 1962. That was considered the first total disc replacement. And as was witnessed in the birth, with the birth of Infuse and the growth of fusion, we now will begin to see finally 61 years later, a rapid acceleration of adoption of total disc replacement. It's happening now. What I'd like to share with you is that we are now over the tipping point. I thought we were gonna be over the tipping point 23 years ago. But here we are. And we're there for several important reasons that we'll touch on. The next 10 years, we will move to the fourth R, from replace to regenerate. It's already started. For example, little sales pitch, my brothers and I are the lead investor in a business called Spine Biopharma. We did what we typically do. We find something in a bigger company that isn't paid attention to, spin it out, and focus capital, time, resources, and strategy to evolve it. That technology is a pharmaceutical injection into the disc that does three things. This compound stops inflammation and reverses it, stops the pain neural pathway from signaling pain, and begins the uh, regeneration of intracellular matrix. So imagine treating a patient before the patient's a surgical candidate. So remember how the population grows? It's because the patient is treated earlier. Today you're treating patients with motion before they need a fusion. Yesterday you were treating patients with fusion. Today you're treating them with motion earlier and it's a bigger patient population and it's a bit younger population. Tomorrow you're gonna to be doing an injection. You or your colleagues will be doing an injection into the disc to slow down the disc degenerative process. There's another company and other businesses working on biologics that are injected into the disc space. And those biologics are cells or uh, other um, human biologics that are um, proliferated, grown, and injected into the space to stimulate healing. So the world's going that direction. It will take 10 more years for that even to be beginning, okay? So there is a very steep growth curve that's gonna occur now in total disc replacement. So what we learn from history is that every single joint in the body goes from fusion to replacement, every single joint. So why should the spine joints not go that direction? The answer is it's impossible for physicians to not treat with motion preservation.
And one thing I'd like to encourage the surgeon industry, the doctor industry in orthopedics to do, if I could ask you to do one thing, introduce total disc replacement into your residency programs. Today, residents are graduating without having done a single total disc. If you wonder, why is it that total disc with the great results that have been published, the long-term efficacy, the high safety, do you know, by the way, that the ProDisc has a 1% or less reoperation rate at the index level? 1%? Can you name a single other medical device in history that has a lesser failure rate? It's not. It doesn't exist. Do you know that Total Disc has more published papers than any other orthopedic medical technology in history? Do you know that there is 20 year clinical evidence demonstrating survival and good to excellent results? And what would be the reason to do fusion if there's the option, if the tissue is healthy enough to do total disc? There isn't a good reason. That's why it shouldn't be done. But physicians, doctors need to be trained in their residency and tested out of their residency, and that will stimulate motion preservation to become the preeminent solution in spine care. And we need one of the largest companies in the industries in the industry to take that direction. It's very tough because there's a lot of profit, profit made in selling fusion technology. And there's a lot of insurance company focus on reimbursing fusion more than reimburse, reimbursing total disc. If we can change that dynamic because it, it is better for the patient, the world's going to change in a much better way. So it happened in hips. It happened in knees, shoulder, ankle. It happens now in spine. The transition in treatment. And this is what it takes. It takes to preserve spinal motion while relieving and treating pain. So remember, that's what we're doing. The purpose is to restore a stable joint. Not just motion, not just any kind of motion, stable motion. So we also have to reduce the need for revision surgery, if it's going to be successful. It also has to be, let's call it reversible, or treated if it doesn't work, like treat be, being able to do a fusion. There has to be a quicker recovery time, and we know that this is from fusion, and it has to foster uh, innovation. So looking at the hip and knee experience, and I'm going to focus on ProDisc, we learned and we're, remember, we're still in the history section of what do we learn from orthopedics. We learned that the implants have to be viewed as being permanent. Well, my goodness, uh, hip and knee joints do not last 20 years. Yet, total disc replacement does. And we have thousands and thousands of case evidence of it. It has to be, um, we have to stabilize the joint. Remember, not just any motion. And the procedure has to be re reproducible. And we got lucky to understand the difference between controlled motion and uncontrolled motion. The key philosophy that I'd like to share here, remember I'm an owner of Sentinel Spine, so I'm biased in my position here when I say this. The key thing that I learned from Dr. Thierry Marnet from Montpellier the inventor of the ProDisc, is that you are treating a diseased space. So when you treat a diseased space, it's never going to function the way the anatomy functioned when we were 18 years old. It's going to function in a diseased way. So, and the other tissues around the disc are diseased too. The bone is, 
the other soft tissues. And the body's adjusted for that. So if you go back in to then restore perfect anatomic motion, the way a normal, natural, healthy disc is, there could be a problem there. But restoring controlled motion is what the philosophy of ProDisc is, which is why it has a 30-year history in the lumbar of still being in place in patients today. Many other discs, not all, follow a nucleus replacement philosophy. So implanting something that restores motion, restores form, restores function, relieves pain, but doesn't give you perfect natural motion, turns out to be a very effective solution. So now let me come to why was 1996 a pivotal time? I want to go back in my head for you as to how did we come to motion as a direction for spine surgery. First, it was this understanding of remove, repair, replace, regenerate. Second, we understood, my brothers and I, that with, and I was the first analyst to write about this, when sophomore Danik spent $50 million to get rights only for spine fusion for BMP2, I understood that we were beginning the regeneration phase without being in the replacement phase yet. Then they filed in 96 for infuse at the FDA for an IDE clinical trial. Acromed in 96 settled the pedicle screw litigation for 100 million. Sophomore Danik later settled for 50 million. And I sent my 20-year-old brother, 21-year-old brother, why would I ever do this, to Amsterdam. There were three conferences. I thought, my goodness, if I send him there, he might never come back. Okay, he did, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> Didn't require any medical care, by the way. Um, and he attended the CCOT conference. This is every two years. And he saw the only time the ProDisc was ever exhibited. It was owned by a company called JBS. The only time it was ever exhibited. And he documented it and brought it back and said, Tony, we got to do something here. He also saw the SB Charité. He said, this is it. We've got to do something. So I'd like to say that Mark of the three brothers is the guy who always has the nose for innovation. And he repeatedly finds things super early and helps lead the brothers along the path uh, to where we have gone. At the same time, I invested in and sat on the board of Ray Medica, which later became Sentinel Spine, um, to further the development of what I thought was really excellent and became the leading, total, uh, the leading prosthetic disc nucleus in the world. It's not commercially marketed because the um, nucleus wouldn't stay in place. It was not predictable what it would do. And it's the only implant put in the body that was not attached to bone. So think about that for the future. If something goes in that space, it's got to be attached or it's going to unpredictably move. So now... Uh, I know I'm uh, approaching the end of my time, so I'll go fast here. Um, Infuse had great success for all these reasons. Fusion advancement, donor site elimination, accelerated healing, clinical validation. Infuse had a lot of problems too, still does. Over-reliance. It caused basically fusion to, excuse me, become what was important when we've got to remember that it's the elimination of pain that's important, and stabilizing the anatomy and supporting the rest of the anatomy without damaging the rest of the anatomy is what motion preservation is about. So now, what does it take for a technology to be ready? In 1900, the average life expectancy in the United States was 47 years. 
for a, an adult for a male. Today it is 78. COVID brought it down one year. Our body is not built to last as long as we're living today. And the fastest growing segment of the, of the population increase is a population that needs orthopedic spine care. And we're all working longer, we're living longer, we are remaining more active, so motion preservation is actually really important. 100% of the population living in America today will suffer from a major orthopedic disease or injury. This is the reason that, uh, remember, um, what does it take for technology to be successful? You gotta understand that as a basis. Secondly, technology needs proven materials. The ProDisc had those proven materials. And by the way, this thesis of what does it take for technology to be successful was not developed recently, developed when um, I was an analyst in the early 1990s, which led to the direction that we went. A ball and socket concept works in so many anatomies should work here because it provides the motion and the controlled motion resists shear while taking the load. The ProDisc also had clinical evidence. So when we started, we said we have to dig up the 64 original patients that Dr. Marnay did to see if this is something we should go forward with. 64 patients, 78 implants, 75% good to excellent results, 100% survivorship of the evaluated patients. There is something good here. And this is seven to 11 years. At that time, the longest clinical data available in total disc. So we said the ProDisc is the disc that we have got to bring to market. We also saw that as JBS was acquired by Esculop, we say this at the brothers. The French are good at inventing. The Germans are good at making it better and the Americans are good at marketing. And so we, put, so we saw those three things come together with the development that Esculap brought of engineering an instrument system that co-functioned with the implant and supported it getting in the right place in the right time interval with the right access. So a co-functioning implant instrument and procedure, that would stimulate the market to move. That is the fourth thing that a technology needs. Now I'm gonna share with you that there are 20 other things a technology needs to be to be successful. I won't read the list, but you can see it here and take a picture of it. Um, Evidence-based is the most important. A technology also needs to serve the six Ps, the patient, the physician, the provider, the payer, the policymaker, and finally the producer. Every one of those six Ps has to be better tomorrow than yesterday for a technology to be successful. And for a technology to be successful, it has to transform the physician community. Today, there are practices all around the United States and globally that only focus on motion preservation, like there are cardiologists, okay, that focus on deploying conservative technology, which was considered radical. Think about this for a minute. It was considered radical 20, 30 years ago to do balloon angioplasty, radical. It was considered ridiculous to put metal in a vessel 30 years ago. What was radical has become conservative. It was radical 30 years ago to think putting in a disc. Today, it's conservative therapy versus fusion. 
here's what happened to us. We thought that the market was going to go crazy, and it did for total disc. Do you realize that $7 billion were invested by industry to evolve total disc replacement technology? $7 billion. More than 50 different discs were invested in, and clinical trials begun. And then there was big disappointment, and I'm going to tell you the secret, how this big disappointment right here happened. Medtronic competed with Synthase to buy the ProDisc. And we were at a board meeting ready to accept a $350 million offer for ProDisc from Synthase. And Medtronic faxed in, there were faxes at that time, an offer for $425 million. But the offer had contingencies. So we decided not to take that offer and take the $350 million offer. Medtronic then did a smart business strategy. They went to Medicare with no clinical data and asked for a coverage decision. Smart, brilliant. Terrible political decision, brilliant business decision. Medicare, because there was no data, killed the reimbursement of total disc replacement. We're still living with that business competitive decision. And the reason Medtronic did that is to protect their infuse and fusion business. Makes sense. But very destructive to ultimately the reimbursement in total disc replacement. I know I'm running a little bit behind. I'll, I'll go a little bit faster. But here we are now, 20 years later, 100% of the private payers and Medicare in the United States reimburse for total disc in cervical spine. 100% reimburse for one level lumbar total disc replacement. About 40% of the private payers reimburse for two level lumbar, and nearly 100% of the private payers rever uh, uh, reimburse for two level cervical. So because reimbursement is shifting, because there is 20 years of clinical heritage, because the adopt, early adopters were right, the market is going to start, it has crossing this chasm, and it's going to begin a 20-year period of growth far outstripping fusion. Okay, this is going to be a little bit crazy what I'm going to tell you, but the new PMAs that Sentinel Spine got one year ago and introduced the Vivo September one year ago, the company has grown its motion business 51% year over year. Now that is physicians saying, I've got the tools, I've got something that works, I've got something that works for 20 years, I've got a procedure that is safe, that's effective, and I've got a range of solutions, of discs to implant based on the needs of the patient and my need as a physician and what the dynamic is uh, in the um, operative anatomy. And so what does it take for a technology to be ready? It takes clinical success correct regulatory strategy. Actually, IP is less important because if you get RP, regulatory property, and CP, clinical property, that cannot be competed against. Do you know that there is no intellectual property of substance behind the protest today? It's all open market. But for a, a, another company to develop the identical disc, they have to take it to a US clinical study. That's a $100 million risk and a seven-year process. 
The star ankle had the same situation. And still today, 30 years later, there isn't a, 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 um, a direct uh, copy of the star ankle. Or 30 years later, a direct copy of the ProDisc. So RP and CP is what we as industry understand is more important than intellectual property. And this is maybe the most important slide of success. You need focus. You need concentration of resources. You need to believe that when everyone says no, then that's when you need to say yes. And when we interviewed in 1999 a bunch of physicians about total disc replacement, and all of them said no, the brother said this is when it's time to say yes. But you have to have grit to push through all the artillery shells falling around you to try to take you out versus where the market is at the time. And take a look at the first pillar. Place capital behind the right entrepreneurs. Slash the word entrepreneurs and say surgeons. It is the right team of surgeons that makes a technology successful or a failure. Yeah, you need the entrepreneur, but more importantly, you need the surgeon innovators to be there who you're going to back. You got to address a big unmet need and you got to be ready to pivot, adapt, and change direction. And then you've got to have the right ecosystem of partners behind you for the technology to be successful. So now I'm going to tell you very briefly, I'm 10 minutes late, I got two more minutes. The Untold Story begins in 1983, which is not on this slide, with the creation of ProDisc version 1 in Dr. Marnay's head. And the first implantation with, through, made by a little French company called JBS, the product was, and you see ProDisc version 1 has two keels and has the polyethylene piece on the superior component and the cup on the inferior uh, component. And you see the next gen, one keel, verse two, uh, the polyethylene component in a shelf that locks in place um, and a, a co-functioning instrument system. Okay? You know this history a little bit. And then finally... The Vivo was, it was uh, first implanted outside the United States in 2005. Put this in your heads. It took from 2005 to 2022 for this to come to the U.S. market and get FDA PMA approval order. This little thing is causing 50% growth in a business today. Tells us something. So now I talk to you about why 1996 was pivotal and the brothers deciding we had to be in the total disk space. Let me tell you that uh, this basis of what happened in 1993 when ABC News 2020 series aired, then the litigation came, uh, evolved substantially after that, then Danik acquired the BMP, then... Um, the Acromed litigation was settled. And here, in 99, is the story. The story of VB aiming, and this is something people don't know about, of owning the total disk space. My brothers and I negotiated with Valdemar Link, and at the same time, with Esculop. And at one point, we were at the position of buying both disks and running two businesses <clears throat> that were going to develop two disks. And Helmut Link, in the final meeting in his apartment at the Waldorf, after 19 versions of definitive agreements were worked on, 300000 in legal fees, and we came to the signing, and Helmut said, Tony, I've decided that I cannot sell my baby. I have the money, I have the business, I have the people, and you've shown us that this can get approved. We're gonna do it without you. 
And I said, Helen, I'm not surprised. You're a smart man. I might do the same thing if I were you. But Helena, I'm going to be your number one competitor. And he laughed just like that. Okay, seriously. He laughed. And he should have laughed because I'm a little kid with two other little kids who've done none of this before ever and had no money. So then we went and completed the deal with Esculap. And I'm going to tell you also what you won't believe. In doing the deal with Esculap, I went to Mr. Brown himself and negotiated the deal him set with him directly at the board meeting. That was a scary thing. We decided, and look at this, to form Spine Solutions in October 1999. You won't believe this, but the brothers invested $25,000, and that was a ton of money to us at the time. Escalop invested $25,000, and we formed Spine Solutions. Then, um, and they contributed the ProDisc. Then, amazingly, I sold them back for $500,000 the distribution rights outside the U.S. with the requirement that we could buy them back at some point. And we did. When we sold the business, we bought it back for $11 million. They made a good return on that investment. They made a great return. Can you imagine this is what my brothers and I invested because this is all the money we had. And the business sold for $350 million. There's a lot more to the story, a lot more to talk about. I'm way over time, so I'll bring it to conclusion here and say that what we learned and what I'd like to share with you is this vision of remove, repair, replace, regenerate. All Healthcare innovation goes through these four phases. 1996 was a pivotal moment that we formed our vision for the future of spine surgery. And what it takes is proven material, proven biomechanical reality, proven clinical experience, a total technology solution, addressing the six Ps. And with focus, concentration of assets, saying yeah, uh, no, being yes with conditions, and grit to make this happen. This is the untold story of motion preservation in America. Thank you very much. No, no, no. I, I know we're way over time. Jack is totally. No, no, but I, you know, I'm glad Tony left a little bit left because um, we're going to try to get Tony and his two brothers sometime in 2024 for one of our quarterly uh, evening series through Seattle Science Foundation. So we can get his brothers to check on his story. Uh, but I think the interplay <laughs> will be wonderful. And the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, you know, Tony's just too, uh, has too much humility to bring it up, but um, these uh, uh, three brothers um, learned uh, their work ethic and they got their moral compass working in the bar that their immigrant parents owned in Detroit. So they come from very humble beginnings. Nobody handed this to them, um, but worked hard and, and found a niche that they were able to explore and explode and uh, you know, just looking at those first few slides and seeing what you've accomplished, knowing where you came from, Tony, is just heartwarming, it's wonderful. Um, and this was one of the best keynote speeches I've ever heard of yep. uh, from any course. So yep. thank you very, very much. Um, to, uh, to use Tony as the launching pad now and kind of light the rocket a little bit.